Okay. So I hope everything is now in place. Uh, today I'm gonna talk about something which is a bit unusual in a way that it's not related to my research directly, but it's kind of a bit related to me if you know me as a person. So it's gonna be a bit boring, I would say, because I'm not gonna show you any result or anything. It's just like uh, so many slides coming after this one regarding how I think about the situation about science communication in general, and after that, science communication in network science. And you may disagree with 99% of the whole material, so it's okay, and I'm here to discuss. But uh, the main idea basically comes from uh, this, that I personally believe in the whole scientific community, in the whole disciplines, people are not really happy with uh, science communication, especially to the public, and mostly it's like an act of degradation. So like people believe that those who do it are doing something not really professional or something. And I highly believe this is not the case. So this is like the very personal motivation for this talk, but it's not the only thing. And uh, to give you some more hints that why I'm this much curious and interested about talking this stuff is that uh, I am the same age that I have in research. I have the same age in doing science communication. So I started this project Seedpo, which was like a website that we write about science like more than 10 years ago. I started in, in my first year as a bachelor, maybe the first year. So like I am as old as in physics as old as in science communication for physics and these projects have worked with me and like uh they have lived with me and now they are kind of very mature and some of them are very famous especially in persian community as most of them are in uh, persian so i have this blog for more than 10 years i have a very specific website for complexity science i host a youtube channel and i used to host uh, podcast in the age that podcasts were not that famous and I have also received some award for it so like this is like my side on doing this and now I'm gonna review some stuff with you which I'm pretty sure you know what it is but the whole idea is that uh, you may have heard this in different scenarios that if a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it. Does it make a sound or not? So it comes from many philosophical type of uh, approaches or like you may have heard it from other parts in physics that uh, it deals with observations or whatever. But my point here is like that I am in that class of people who believe if a tree, if a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, it does not make any sound. Despite that you may argue uh, differently, I would say that uh, you should hear it and it, there should be someone else that you tell it and someone else to tell to. So finally, people out of that forest know that the tree has fallen. And this is like the whole idea behind science communication in general, that science basically diffuses in a population through science communication. And it can be represented in so many different ways. For example, many ideas in ancient Persia or India or Greek they have been completely forgotten and now famous under different names because science communication has been like not complete in, in, in history. So basically there have been many ideas that have been lost through history, has been rediscovered many times later because basically if you produce science, whatever that, that means, you need to communicate it to other people. And uh, it, it is very simple. So for any fields of expertise, there is always someone like this guy who knows something and there is another guy who knows more. And now the idea is that if the one who knows more tries to, in a way, educate someone who knows less, then science communication is happening. So science communication is a very general term for any approach that you transfer knowledge from one who knows more to one who knows less. And basically it's like a two way street because people know different stuff and it can always happen in a very uh, broad way. And of course I can give you a bonus slide. You can always represent the whole idea as a network that you have different disciplines and people know different 
things and people try to educate the, themselves in different ways and these uh, axes are not uh, orthogonal each other because basically not two disciplines are really forming a perpendicular uh, basis in terms of uh, ideas and whatever. So at the population level, the idea is that we always have some field of expertise. Hey, there are always people who are experts, like uh, in science, these are like seasoned researcher, people who are like really experienced in that field. Then we have less knowledgeable people. It includes like people who have some education, like uh, they have been out of grad school recently. They are still not as expert as the main, like the first group, but they still know much more than the majority of people. And people are here. And then at the very end of this axis, we have science deniers or people who don't like science or whatever. And basically, science communication happens from right to left. And if we just narrow it down specifically for people, it is called popular science or science journalism. Uh, this part, usually people assume or like whenever we talk about science communication, people just uh, think that we are talking about this part, that we are telling people like the majority of the society about these ideas. But uh, this is very valuable, this is very important, but this is just like uh, one form of doing science communication. So when we look at these axes, anything that goes from right to left is called science communication from my perspective. And this one is much more famous because of course it deals with people and it comes with popularity and otherwise. And uh, there are two very famous figures that I like, one is uh, Carl Sagan and another is like George Gamow. They are so famous. They are like real scientists who have uh, committed to this uh, genre of science communication. But uh, basically to me, the meaning of science communication is that it is whatever that makes concepts and processes accessible and enjoyable in a more human way for less knowledgeable audience. And it doesn't matter from what point on the right axis it goes to the left axis or right points to the left one. Whatever it is, it is called science communication. But what I feel like doing is what yeah, my grand- I, I would like to play this part of the video from this uh, guy. Uh, most people in physics know him. He's Leonard Susskind, and uh, he is like a famous theoretical physicist, uh, one of those older school people that I like. And this is from his talk in Santa Fe Institute, 2013. Grandmother called Kvetching. Fetching means complaining, and I'm going to complain right now. It's not a very gracious thing to do when you're invited to give a lecture, but I'm going to complain about the venue for the lecture. My complaint is that these goddamn machines are ruining my culture. In the old days, when you went to a lecture like this, a physicist would get up and with nothing but a piece of chalk in his hand to defend himself and to attack you and do whatever it was he was going to do, that professor would get up and there was body language. There were gestures. If he was any good, there was a ballet. Sometimes they were bad. There was one fellow, well, you know, you know of course, who was the great master of this was Dick Feynman, an old friend of mine. There were some people who were bad at it. Uh, there was one guy, very, very famous, incidentally, I won't mention his name, and he would stand at the blackboard and make little tiny things. And he would mug and then he would turn around and look at the ocean. <laughs> he was terrible, but it was a human thing. You remembered, you very well remembered who the, who the lecturer was. And you remembered what he did, and you remembered how he moved. These days, it's completely different. You stand at a computer like this, and all you get to do is push buttons. This, to me, is an ultimate degradation of my culture. And I am going to say the next time I come back here, I want a blackboard. Uh, this is basically the whole idea that when you're doing a lecture at a class or like at a more technical seminar level, it used to be more than just like talking. It was more about presenting. Once I, ta I told Alejandro, we were in Mallorca, that you once will quote this from me, that 
if you're giving a talk at the NetSci or whatever, and if your research is not that groundbreaking, at least let me enjoy the show. So like a lot of people back then in time were much better in like uh, presenting their stuff because uh, they only had like this blackboard and nothing more. And now it has changed. So what I feel another thing is now, okay. So how really science does diffuse in population through science communication? Um, it is very interesting that uh, basically there is a, there is a couple, it's very related to how people talk about and think about science and how they value it in a society. So for example, in Islam, it's very funny that science and knowledge is always compared to wells. And there is this law about wells that if you have excess amount of some wells, it is your duty to share it to the public. And that rule is also there for your knowledge. So technically, Muslims are supposed to teach if they know something. And this is kind of interesting because it forms a cascade of information from the top of the pyramid from people who are really expert to the normal audience in any types of way. So this is called the chain model, that if there are these experts who can just like let other people know, and then they let other people know, and a step by step, it goes up. So these arrows have some sort of meaning, like I will talk, what does it mean that they go that high and they are that bold or that thick? But for, for now, this is like a very trivial way to think about it, that there are always some people who know more and they step by step, they try to... Uh, let other people know. But this is not what really always happened. Uh, a very famous example of another way is the Faraday model. So this is uh, from 1827 when Faraday was like presenting his lectures at these Christmas uh, lectures. They are still happening at the Royal Institute. So the idea was that they would like, ad invite a very famous scientist and that scientists start telling people about the latest state of the research. So basically the Faraday model, as opposed to the chain model is like that basically experts talk to people without any intermediate steps. And this is like one of those things that now matters a lot because now experts need to go to these arrows which are much higher and they have to go to higher heights because they need to catch people. So Feynman, as like uh, Susskind mentioned previously, he was a very famous character in physics that he could explain everything to everyone. And if you look up his videos on YouTube, he has like these uh, short talks or whatever designed for different audience. So he has these QED talks, very advanced topic on quantum electrodynamics, the same thing that he got a Nobel Prize on. He has these normal university level type of talks. This is like the messenger lectures at Cornell, which Bill Gates was funding them to be recorded later. And then he has like these BBC videos that are for like very layman. So the idea is that can everyone do it? And why Feynman is so famous? Well, there is another thing that I want to mention about Feynman, that Feynman was like a great hero of mine and so many other physicists, but Feynman was also a very curious character in a way that he had this ego that he wanted to let people know. So a bit of these type of things always come from this, that people want to show others that how smart they are. So it's always like a backhand idea that when you're doing science communication, you are letting people know that you are very smart because you can digest things very fast and it has always been there but people usually don't talk about so this is something to keep in mind as well that a lot of times these are not really honest uh endeavors but they are motivated by so many different reasons it's not just they really are devoted to it. they like doing it it's not like something very purely honest so, so far, nothing new. I'm not going to go through some of these challenges. Like, now, shall everyone do science communication? Definitely not. But what does that mean? It means that you are allowed to do science communication to the extent that you can do it. Sometimes you should stop at the level of, like, uh, expert to knowledgeable. You shouldn't go further. You should not never. You should not talk to people. At least from the COVID time, we know that not every scientist is eligible to talk to the public. Uh, public. There is also this very famous story from Feynman, the hero of like teaching everything to everyone, that once he was asked to talk about spin half 
uh, particles and he promised to prepare a lecture and the next day he said, sorry, I can't do it. I can't talk to freshman people. Apparently it is because we don't really understand it. So for sure, the first step in science communication that you should really understand what you're saying. And I guess this is like a big thing. Like a lot of people don't know that they don't really understand something where they're doing it. And the broader the audience, the deeper you should really understand it. Because basically science communication needs a lot of skills. And when you look at these arrows, the higher they go, it means they are requiring much more skills than just like that field of expertise. So there is this people skill on the y-axis that if you really want to go from expertise, from the expert level to people level, or you should really go like, it's like flight, that if you want to go from Finland to Sweden, it's different from going to Finland to the US, so you fly at different uh, heights, right? So if you really want to go higher, you really need to gain more skills. So you need to have people skills. A very nice famous example for this is Edward Witten. So again, in physics community, he is a hero, he is a god. I have a huge respect for him, I love him, but it doesn't make him a good science communicator for him. So very recently, well, not recently, like four years ago, he wrote this mini, mini introduction to information theory. And as a fan of information theory, and it was written by Witten, I wanted to read this. So the text was fine as any other text, like very to the point, very good. But then he gave a talk, I guess it's in uh, IAS, and the matrices of systems A and B are given by these formulas where we wrote down rows of A before and row B. And when you look at all his slides, slides, another class, all his slides are basically a copy of the text and monotone, very boring, and nobody can follow what he's saying unless they know information theory. Then I found this video, which is like quite to the point and very funny. I was at the University of Pennsylvania in like 1982 through 85. Okay. And I went to a lecture that he gave and he said things like, as every school child, a quantum field theorist knows. <laughs> you know, just like spontaneously laughing for no reason. Uh, the number of generations is tied to the index of an elliptic operator on a Calabi manifold. And the guy next to me says, I've been a quantum field theorist for 40 years. I don't know any of this stuff. So like, this is a very famous attitude from a lot of these uh, famous people. I remember we had this quantum electrodynamic course and the professor came to the classroom and he, as he said, as you know, Lie algebra from your high school. And I was like, no, we even don't know normal algebra from high school, how we can have it. And then this is like the whole attitude that you can be Edward Witten, but you still can fail at science communication for like a more broad audience. So you should always know who can you really influence. I mean, it's really valuable to ask Edward Witten to do it, but he is really bad at that. So there is another physicist, his name is Kamran Waffa, and he worked with Edward Witten and he is very famous. He's a professor at Harvard. And Kamran Waffa, he is like much better at this and he has books on science communication and stuff. And once I talked to him, he was really defending Witten. But anyway, he is like Waffa. Waffa understand what Witten says, but me as a normal physics student would never follow. Like the same as just you saw here. Anyway, so I was at the let's, University of Penn. Let's go. I would like to introduce some other resources. There is this uh, website we uh, wired and uh, they have this program, five levels of difficulty that they ask some experts and they want them to choose a topic and try to explain them to five different types of persons. The first one is like someone like a kid, then goes higher and higher. And the fifth level is someone who is like, for example, was a PhD in physics. And now you're going to talk about dimension to them. And uh, these videos are very good in a way that you see these people who are good at science communication at different levels. That's how they tune their voice, their word, their phrasing, and the structure of uh, presentation by just talking. So for example, there is this guy who you may know him. He's very famous uh, because of his uh, programming course at edX. There is Sean Carroll, very famous physicist. 
and other people. And when you watch these videos, they're quite interesting that how someone can really do it. And this is like a very good idea of science communication at all level, which I highly recommend you have a look uh, about uh, all of the things that are out of your experience. I am Sean. Hello, Hello. 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 Okay, so the problem with science communication is that it's a lossy process, meaning that every time we try to go from right to left, we lose some part. A very famous, interesting example is the concept of entropy. So entropy starts with a very rough formulation from the right. And then we try telling people what it is. And at the end of the day, a high school student would tell his dad that entropy is a measure of disorder and entropy is always increasing. So the world is going to in a more disordered state and we're going for anarchy. I mean, first of all, entropy is not a measure of disorder. Disorder is the first concept that we can associate to this formulation. Sometimes we can say that by increasing entropy, we, we have order in system, as we have seen in many complex systems, that increasing entropy would lead to the emergence of some phenomena or some order. So basically, disorder is a very vague, bad way of phrasing entropy. And then even disorder is different than anarchy. Anarchy is not a physical term. It comes from like other disciplines. And basically going from this process would lead to so many misunderstanding. So we should be very careful. Like every time we are trying to do science communication, we are losing some step. The good thing about, so this is the problem with the chain model. So the chain model at every stop, something is lost. The Faraday model would uh, preserve more of the structure, more of the uh, purity of that, but it's again, very expensive. There is this very example that I really like. It comes from the famous poet Rumi. That it's called the story of the lion tattoo that a guy goes to a tattoo place and asks to have a tattoo on his like shoulder. And the first, the, as soon as the lady starts like doing it because of the pain, like what part of the lion it is, and the guy replied that it's like the tail. So okay, avoid the tail, go for the other parts. And then again, another pain comes because of the needle, like what part of the lion it is, and say it's like, I don't know, the eye, and like so skip that. And after a while, the guy comes out from the tattoo place with a shape which does not resemble anything then a weird uh, circle than a lion. And then this famous story in the Persian culture is about oversimplification or like when you cannot basically tolerate a whole process. And this is a very typical scenario in science communication that people try to oversimplify something. They start from a lion and end up with some like useless uh, curve on the shoulder of some other people. Another thing is that in practice, some of these arrows are very uh, bold, meaning that a lot of people are doing that, but some places it's not so many. So for example, uh, there, there are a lot of material for learning uh, basics physics, but not much better than that and not much easier than that. And it's also a very famous thing, but in network science and in other disciplines, sometimes it's even different. Even there is nothing to the left part. There are always some experts and those experts let other less expert people know, but after that, there is nothing going on. So now the question is that what is the situation in network science? And uh, this is now a very personal feeling about this situation. I may be totally wrong, but this is about how I feel about it. So if you review the resources that we have, for the popular science culture, we have very good books, at least to a good extent. So for if the target is the layman, if we are like looking at the general audience, there's so many books. At least compared to 10 or 20 years ago, we have so many books. And even if you read this like post from Petter, you will see that, uh, before networks, we had these complexity science books and like critical phenomena ideas and a lot of these things. So, so they have been there. And it's pretty good there, I would say. <clears throat> and nowadays we have much better resources. We have the quantum magazine. Quantum magazine is like 
the okay quantum magazine is a place that i'm very jealous of so they are very good at doing this and there are these podcasts coming from them and they are doing fantastic job over this but the problem is that these are for laymen for at university level or like at the education level in a serious fashion the question is that it's a bit different so Yes, we have some resources. For example, these modules from Complexity Explorables are like great. I don't know if you have worked with them or not, but they're really handy. There are a lot of modules that you can basically use them in uh, in so many different ways. You can use them in your classroom and you can ask students to play with them to learn something. Uh, this is a very famous one that there is this herd immunity network model. I mean, it's very simple, but anyway, people can try different network model, play with transmissibility. They, uh, there is this wax and optic ratio, and basically you can see how the dynamics of this is spreading evolve. So these are very these are very precious things for our community. And uh, I'm a bit sad that <clears throat> these works are not really uh, appreciated that much in our community. Then of course, there are very famous resources. Uh, Mark Newman maybe is the pillar in our community in a way. Uh, his old surveys, his books, his uh, papers, they are written in a very clear way which uh, all a student can benefit from it. But uh, there are not that many people like him doing uh, this type of approaches. It's not a matter of judging him or the community. It's just like about the statistics of science communication, like good material, right? Uh, recently, Santa Fe Institute has done something which is a bit weird. It looks like a very fancy selection of papers that they call them fundamental papers in complexity science. It comes in four volumes and it's not just about network, it's, just, it's about the whole thing. But when you look at the list of the papers and how they have been selected, there are a lot of arguments that you may come up with. So despite this is like a good selection, and it's good to tell people these are like very important papers in network science and like uh, emergence phenomena, what, 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 but still these are not something that really help people like a normal student in uh, complex science. Actually, Peter has a very nice <clears throat> post also discussing this issue, but anyway, Another thing which comes from the physics culture is like in physics, uh, everyone who is writing a thesis was supposed to write it in a way that the first few chapters that you write as introduction should be very informative in a way that the next student who comes to your group at least should use your thesis as the best text available to be ready to do research on that. But I kind of believe this is not the culture, at least at our department here. So theses are not really appreciated and people really don't want to make them a text for communicating their knowledge to the, their peers. And I believe that that culture from physics was a big thing that uh, a lot of times there are these theses that of course nobody cites, but when you read them, you really enjoy. And I guess that can be a thing. But all in all, you can look at all of the resources available. There is, of course, uh, other material like Peter's blog is like great. I like it. And I, I have confessed it on the public that in the last four years, nothing has been that much interesting for me to read other than his blog. And the thing is like that other blogs are bad. And this is not that we only have few things it's not that we have so many blogs but most of them are bad there's also this quote from Leonard Susskind that when everyone is an expert no one is an expert and, and I really like it because like there are a lot of people who I, I appreciate blogging but a lot of people do it and they're not really expert so they're kind of diluting the thing so these days we have medium and these type of platforms that people start writing about stuff and there a lot of them are bad so that is why I really like uh, reading Peter's blog I also interviewed him and there is this like a uh, long conversation with him about his whole experience as a blogger 
And if you're interested, you can read. So, <clears throat> so when we compare network science to physics, I believe this is the pattern that uh, from the expert level, of course, we have very good papers. And uh, so experts can basically communicate to their peers. And then we have like other material, like good review articles, and the field has grown in a way that still, if you are early in this business, you can get a lot of good stuff. And as I previously mentioned, there's also a huge amount of resources for laymen. But in between, there is this gap. And this gap is very important to fill because we have people in high school now who are interested to learn about complex systems and network science. But the question is that what should I study in university so that I become a network scientist? And the answer is that I don't know, do physics, computer science, something, 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 and wait for the right time until you're here. Then you can start doing network science. So if we have a good coverage of this part, we can maybe have a much better stream of information in this discipline. And I believe this part should be improved. And the main reason that this part has not been improved because there is no incentive for this. Uh, nobody is uh, getting any benefit of improving that. It needs a huge investment from universities and people who are designing curriculums and like uh, special topics in uh, different disciplines. For example, when you look at the uh, Steve Estroget course on nonlinear dynamics and chaos, uh, this is related to complex system, but it comes from the mainstream applied mathematics. So there is a very nice course here that there is a good book. There is like video lectures. So people in the first years of uh, a bachelor program can really follow. But we really do not have any similar courses like this for other people. If you look up all the network related courses online, there are some of them which are really good. For example, you can find our lectures on online. You can find uh, lectures from Oxford, they're really good. But none of them as complete as this course. So none of them come with a really good textbook, which follows by good problem sets, which follows by uh, huge uh, conversations around those problem sets. So this course is a very good case that we need more materials like this for complex systems and network science related courses. So basically, I've been in charge of doing this TAing of this course and that Every year we've been trying to improve this. And we have faced so many challenges in a way that uh, this, is, this is now on the other side. Like I've been saying that what are these issues and now I'm trying to figure out what should we do, but it's really hard. It's really hard because of this very famous example that I like that a lot of people in academia, they avoid designing a good course. It is because it's damn time consuming. Like when you come up with a course, it's not a matter of only how much you know it. It's a matter of designing material that people with different background can uptake it and learn it with a reasonable space without doing too much effort. So you want to do some optimization problem. And most people in academia have never had any training for that. So in academia, we have built this system that people are not trained to be good teachers and we expect them to be teachers. So some of them are good just out of accident or whatever, but that's the thing. So like you have been doing research and now you're supposed to design a course and all of the courses in network science are like that, that there is a good text, but there is not a good problem set coming. So we use Newman in our course, right? So we use uh, Mark Newman's textbook on network science. And uh, it's a very nice book, it's a very nice read, but uh, it comes with a problem sets that uh, they are not really that great. Maybe they are the best we have. Like for example, Barabashi book does not come with a very reasonable problems at all, I would say. 
And uh, there are other mathematical books on graph theory, which are like uh, too rigorous for this type of courses. And uh, even when you look at uh, Mark's, Mark Newman's uh, problem sets, they are designed in a way that some of them can be answered very easily. And some of them you really need to spend a lot of time and you need to do a lot of things which are not useful. So for the pro for the purpose of learning, every problem set should come with this idea that there is this gained value that when you go through one, two, three, five problems, step by step, you learn something. So that example should be designed very carefully. So it's not just like some paperwork. It's not just like some load of work that you are assigning to some poor student to do. There should be some learning goal behind it. A lot of problem sets. So if you remember your early courses in mathematics, like calculus one or physics ones, there have always been these courses, the, these problems that were scored as like normal, difficult, very hard. But there was always problem that when you solve one of them, you would basically be able to solve 10 more similar because they had this core of information or tricks or whatever that after doing that, you would kind of be uh, very technical after that. And this is now my problem with this issue. So now I'm, I'm working and coming up with reasonable problem sets for our students. We want to design a pool of questions so that we can update them that if students have answered to them, we can just like shuffle and find them. But it's very hard because there is a bunch of problems. And if we just change one parameter in a way, the problem would be too hard to answer. It would be a research problem from now on. Like for example, with generating functions, it's a very nice framework, but the problem is that a lot of those uh, summations do not converge if you just want to solve them analytically. So it's out of the game. If you put the tree like assumption away, it goes away. When you wanna teach people message passing approaches, you can tell them about the scenario that how it's going. But when you want them to write an answer in one pages analytically, there is not that many nice examples because if you have already told them about percolation at the classroom, what else are you going to tell them to do at home? And this is like uh, what I'm really ch facing these days that I have been working on finding reasonable problems and reasonable uh, questions for this course. And I have not been really successful. So <clears throat> uh, there is nothing more that I would like to talk about, except that the only way that science communication at the university level can be improved, I really believe is true having real incentives, which apparently no university is carrying that much anymore. So people who are researchers basically find it very hard and very time consuming and, re and rewardless to do this. Okay, thank you very much. It was my last talk at Alto. I wish you a happy summer, thanks. <laughs>
So I start with this idea that if a tree falls in a forest and nobody hears it, has it really happened? So like science communication is an answer to that, that you try to uh, let more people know about some scientific idea like this. Mm -hmm. So, and the difference between science education is like that science communication can be part of the, science communication can be part of the science education, but education is a more systematic wave and it includes much more stuff, for example, mm -hmm. Examination is part of science education, but communication is like it can be any person to person conversation during coffee time. It's not necessarily part of a system. It's much more informal than science education. It's like I see you in a coffee break. I ask you about implementing something and you let me know and you try to come up with something. It's like when you have an exam the next day and you are very tired of your teacher and then you find one Indian guy on YouTube that they explain everything to you very nicely. So that's not part of the education system, but the part of the communication system. That's, that's education. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you wanna play with these words, they all mean, but for yeah, me, yeah. for me, science education is the official system that a country is undergoing. Mm -hmm. And now science communication is anything that is either part of that or like it's in a more informal way of doing this. So for example, you are in a taxi sitting to next person that you have no idea and they start talking about inflation. And then you know something in economics and you try to inform them. Or you are sitting with your grandpa and your grandpa is talking about vaccines and how they are bad and you do your best to convince them that, hey, this is not how you think about this is like this way. Mm -hmm. But that's different from watching YouTube video because YouTube video you cannot really no react. no 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 but that's 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 uh, a very one directed way but mm -hmm. yeah but you can still leave comments ask questions yeah so I like I noticed that your kind of idea mm -hmm. that you have for science communication is always this kind of unidirectional that it goes from this expertise but you always say that it goes from right to left. Yeah, it but goes from right to left, but it's it yeah. it happened. No, the thing is like that. It happens through having a dialogue, of course. But the flow of information is always like someone is informing someone. Mm -hmm. How that happens, of course, through communication, through talking, through uh, manipulating, sometimes even. Yeah. yeah, because like, how do you want to convince people who don't like vaccine? You should kind of push them in a. You should corner them in a way, then, then you try to convince you them. That will help, Sometimes it does. When you deal with the public, it's much more trickier than a normal audience. Like you should always first convince people to listen to you. And that is the point that I, I, I don't know if you were here that I said this. If, you, if your research is not that groundbreaking, at least let me enjoy the show. Because I've I've been doing uh, I've been a high school teacher an elementary school teacher for a while and I was once teaching in a school and a, a student told me that hey we like what you tell us not because physics interesting but because we like our, your outfit so like when you are like a teacher even the way that you present yourself the way you smile the way you call people and grab their attention. These are very side things to the physics part. Like my outfit has nothing to do with my knowledge, but because you are now dealing with an audience which care about this stuff, you should be careful about them so that they like you in the first place. And then you try to inform them and like teach them. Yes, but I think that's not the essence of it because for example, these, I don't know, vaccine skepticism mm -hmm. people who are skeptical about vaccines mm -hmm. who are skeptical about climate change people who are trying to see you or like trying to like manipulate yeah yeah. Right? yeah for sure for sure there is this very famous example that once in the US there was a scientist who was invited for one of these what's this type of talks that you do on TV to convince. There was a scientist and some science denier 
And you can guess what happens. The science denier won because scientist guy didn't have those type of populists and other skills to convince people and that guy could have. And it's, and in a lot of cases, it's much easier to, to make people believe in the wrong thing than the uh, real thing because sometimes reality is very tricky to figure it out, right? Mm -hmm. So of course, these are techniques that both groups use, but but it's not about that you are uh you are you are not cheating you are just like using the very human nature to let them there is this quote from a very famous comedian that i forgot that he says that if we really want to tell the truth to people you should turn it to a joke otherwise they would kill you you know, like if you really want to criticize some people, you should first make them laugh and then tell it to them. Otherwise, people are not really open. So what I'm saying is that science communication requires these type of skills. When you are at the university, you don't care what you are wearing today. You don't care uh, how beautiful your slide is. You talk in a very hand wavy, vague way, but Miko understands it because he's on the same page and same uh, wavelength of you in this topic. But if you now go out of this room, see a random person on the street, you should be very careful because these people can judge you and their judgment do not let them get to the sense. So for example, you may talk about some political idea and at the same time, you're talking about some economical idea your political idea is against that type of party, but your economical idea or like what you are talking about the economy is true, but the person does not want to listen to you, not because you are wrong, but because you are in the other party that they don't like it, you know? So it's it's so so if you are if you are in favor of one political party and your audience is in favor of a different party, but we are also talking about something which is true. By the very nature that it is true, that is a fact, does not lead that these people believe in you because you are in a different party. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make them believe in what you are saying is really a fact, you should first let them trust you or like you and then try to educate them or communicate that idea, you know? It's like all of those mass teachers that people just, hate them and as a result they hate math a lot of people in high schools hate math because they hate their teacher mm -hmm. so it's like part of the science communication that teachers should be trained in a way so that people are comfortable in the classroom experience so that they pass the the very essence of the communicator so that they get to the part that is science because science is, it's 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 a very bad, uh, or it's a very misconception that people believe that you can get to science. No, you always get to science through some medium. Like it, it really matters that the first time that you are reading condensed matter physics, what textbook you are reading, what teacher you are listening from. Yes, in, in, in reality, it should be the case that it should be regardless of who is the teacher, regardless of what book you are reading, but it always a human thing. It highly matters that the first time you are learning something, who you are learning it from. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. Do you have like a solution to this? Like Nobody wants to do science at, at what level? At well, the student level? Well, you have the gap. And yeah. Look at the answer, what is the gap part? So, so in network science, like in physics, because of the heritage, we we have covered all the parts. In network science, uh, talking to people is very fancy, so everyone would like to talk about sure. it. And so, yeah, and then we get to this part and the incentive is that universe, it's like that, well, like, for example, you as a professor, what is your incentive of designing a course for uh, like 
third year or four year bachelor student or master student. It is just by force. Well, I don't know. Like there's something to that. There's more than probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. But like as a researcher, doing research for you is much easier and much more beneficial. So is the gap here the students or? Yeah, yeah. Here is like starting from grad school to mostly uh, after high school to beginning of grad school. So uh, the idea is that, for example, if you want to, we have this. Uh, this is principal plus the econometric plus for complete. Yeah, yes, that's true. But it's uh, very, like, for example, we always have these issues that uh, we need to have a, a good amount of TA people. So tiers are not really happy of doing this because it's too much of work. And then uh, we have designed it and it's like very, uh, so if we imagine that every year there was this, imagine the way that how citation matters on your career in science, teaching would matter the same way. There was some score, let's say, that people who have done much better science communication would be evaluated the same way. But this is like very hidden. It's always somewhere in your CV, and then you go to the job talk and you get the job, and nobody cares after that, right? No, I think well, not like for example, I just went through this teaching evaluation. Yeah, for the. Anyway. Yeah, but when you become a tenure, nobody really cares anymore, right? But they don't care about the teaching and the research either. <laughs> <laughs> but, but still, you have this peer pressure or like you go to conferences and from that point, you only deal with your research ideas, right? It's not like that you go to NetSci and people ask you, so Miko, how is your course going? Nobody cares about yeah. that. No, I, I mean, I sort of, I agree that there's like, mm. people don't care about it. There is some mechanisms, but like, we do it more than, and here, even at all, there's like a, it's called this tenure track. Uh -huh. They, they, in theory, they have teaching and research, and uh -huh. you could sort of pass by both of them. Yeah. But on the, practically, they don't want to uh -huh. pass anyone by the teaching, so only like 10% of something like that. Yeah. I mean, I think Mm. Mm -hmm. not really no. Yeah. And, so yeah, and I also believe that here the classroom experiences are very dull at all too. So I don't know. It has always been like that and people are very used to it, but there are very few classes that I have heard that there is this experience that it's really a classroom, that conversations happen. Like it's either there is like a monologue coming from the lecturer or at the very best, uh, one or two people ask questions while <clears throat> it should be not like that. Uh, it's like that a classroom should be a place that people come up with questions and answer if we just want to, a classroom experience should be much more than like a YouTube video, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, here I, I have a bit uh, this type of feeling that students don't care that much about that engagement and professors, like, why should I do more? And it goes into this loop that the classroom experience gets less engaging and less interesting anymore. So now most of the people that I have talked to here, they prefer to have very nice material ready on their website. Like most professors here, they want to have their own lecture notes because when you have it on the website, no student would say, hey, I have problems. Like there is always like, go, go read that. And uh, while I, I had a very different experience in my bachelor time that my professor were against having lecture notes. They were like, we stick to this uh, main textbook. And now you come to my classroom if you want a lecture note. And the classroom 
to a good extent was designed in a more active way. So you could take some notes and stuff. But here the students are like, no, there is always some slides or some lecture notes, which is much smaller than the main textbook. So we don't need to go to any textbook. You don't know. We don't need to go to any other resources. There is this, we need this much of effort. I need to spend like this much of time every week and I get this score. So it's like a very mechanical. So the thing that at also, which I never understood is that if someone is really good, where they can go. Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the, like what has happened here, it was used to be more like a kind of described as old school kind mm. of stuff. Uh, but like exactly because they wanted to push this uh, teaching, mm. like as some of the things that I evaluated, for example, mm -hmm. then this that means that the professors have to sort of make the students happy. Yeah. So they are like the customers. Yeah. Rather than some. And then then it go and like then if you do something like this, then you get like really bad grades. And yeah. So it's like the students would like if they say yeah, yeah. they they stop even goals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So so I think this how they have organized this evaluation seems quite okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. exactly what you want mm. more this appreciation. <laughs> Exactly. I we had a crazy professor. I remember that he was very smart in a way that he would remember everyone at the classroom, and he had this habit of asking questions from different people. And uh, he has he learned it after three or four sessions that what question he should ask. I mean, I guess it's a bit very uncommon in here and maybe the culture is different but in Iran asking questions from a student was quite normal and the professor used to ask different questions at different levels from different people and he always like used to design the course in a way that he would come to the classroom completely ready to teach and then try to fine-tune the level and the scope of the course depending on the audience so for example he would ask me this question and another person a different question and then he would like use that conversation between these two people and like elevate the course if the audience could tolerate it. Yeah. This can never happen in this setting here because you have a very, it's, it's like that going from Chinese restaurant to McDonald's, you're giving the same burger to everyone regardless of how they're doing. Yeah, I think like there's some problems here with being like very big classes. Mm -hmm. Like if you have like hundreds of students, it's yeah. really difficult. And also the students can sort of choose what they take, so they are not yeah. living in the same background. Mm -hmm. Another way is this culture that if I now ask, and I usually start always start my lectures in a way that the first lecture I always try to ask students about. Well, they but then nobody okay. like says anything. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's maybe one person. <laughs> and then, yeah. then you end up like doing something with them, but then yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is like that. It's a very different classroom experience, and even the TA sessions is like that. Uh, I don't know if I told you this or not, but there was this girl this year or last year that she was really good, and when she delivered the project, I asked her, "Would you like to work more on it?" And I was very happy because like she was so good, and I was expecting that she can do much more better now and. Apparently, she's liking, and she uh, she wrote to me that, am I not getting the score of this? I said, no, 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 you definitely get. I just wanted to give you this chance that if you want to work on it, work on it. It's it's fine to me. You're doing great. And she replied that, if I'm getting the score, I really don't want to work on it. And she was angry, and I was like, it was an opportunity for learning more. Like, why you're, and why you're angry, you could just say, so like I have this feeling that it it never happened to me in any of these last four years of teaching here that someone really wants to do more because yeah 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 but but you know like this is a bit sad for the teacher that you can never. <clears throat> Or I don't know, like if there is there is this high bar, like this good average, 
but everyone is now very close to that. Like, I believe the real human situation is that these people would finally leave and one of two of them would come to network science. But if those two are very similar to those averages, that's sad. We want people who are more interested at least in a way. But maybe I am very biased because of my uh, physics background and something like that and less competitive situation. But here I believe that everyone is very similar to everyone else. And I guess that's not very good for education system because at the very end, everyone would write very similar things and when you come to the research world then that's a different story you, you you want to you now have nature physics you can publish there and you have like some normal journal and if everyone is treated to do just average then who who would get to a very high places yeah yeah it's interesting people mm -hmm. for instance this is yeah. important yeah. no okay Thank you, everyone. <laughs> and uh, wish everyone online and on site a very nice summer. Bye.